everybody. Uh, I'm Merle Robinson, and I have Pat Mooney with me, and we're here as part of the Armchair Dragoons uh, uh, online convention. Howdy, howdy. And we're planning to talk today about some of the things that have went on as we've looked at designing games for the American Revolution. And if things go well, we'll be added by have a, a third join us shortly. Um, so uh, basically, this is a, a chance for us to discuss things we learned along the way, both in terms of, of game design and the period, and try to share that with all of you. Um, uh, I'm Merle Robinson. I'm the lead designer for the National Security Decision Making Game. We've recently built a live action role play game dealing with the First and Second Continental Congress up to the point of the Declaration of Independence which is designed primarily for academic environments, but we have run it at public events, and we'll run it again this year at Origins, Gen Con, and Dragon Con. And uh, Pat is with Nations and Canons, and I'll let him do his introduction. Hey, so I'm, uh, I'm the founder of Flag Bear Games uh, and co-creator of Nations and Canons, which is uh, it's a tabletop role-playing game. It's an adaptation of uh, the Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition uh, rule set, but specifically for role-playing uh, in grounded historical settings, um, with our, our flagship uh, title being uh, an exploration of the American War of Independence. Particularly the first half uh, is the book that we're working on right now. So when you talk about the first half, just for clarity, you're talking from like 76 to 81? <laughs> uh, so uh, it, it's, it's a great question. I think there's a, there's a lot of different ways you can um, kind of s like segment that storyline. Um, we jump in in the uh, middle of 75 uh, with Bunker Hill, and we go through till uh, the end of Valley Forge, uh, which is a little bit dramatized, right? Actually, I think it's, that's an, a, an interesting talking point, right? Because the war can broadly be divided into uh, the period before uh, other European powers, like the the French and the Spanish, threw in 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 active combat operations, right? Um, and the period where the Americans were on their own, you know, but uh, receiving covert funding and aid from uh, from uh, Spain and France, and, and uh, you know, loans from the Dutch and so have you. Um, and so we chose when we we're doing a, a two part campaign. Um, we chose to end at Valley Forge um, because it is this great kind of lionized moment in American pop culture history of this difficult winter um, where you had, you know, this um, uh, this intense amount of training uh, and professionalism that actually comes into the Continental Army as a result of uh, von Steuben's reforms. Uh, but it's also where news travels across the pond. You know, um, now uh, Franklin had successfully managed to finagle um, King Louis to throw in after Saratoga, but news doesn't really uh, come back to the camp in a big way until uh, after the harsh winter at Valley Forge. And so that's where we're kind of setting the climax of our first first storyline. Okay. Were there particular mechanical reasons that you picked that, or was it all based on the politics? Uh, I think the mechanic one, you know, uh, so with a tabletop role-playing game, what you really want to do uh, when you're designing that is to identify themes that resonate. Um, and in some cases, you know, Valley Forge is uh, often talked about. It's not actually the hardest winter that the Continental Army ever faced, right? That was, I think, the 1779 or 80 in Morristown, which was, you know, like one of the hardest winters uh, in all of the 18th century. Um, but uh, Valley Forge is this is understood to be this turning point. And so we want to unpack some of the civics of that, um, uh, you know, in the political ramifications um, that are coming up in Continental Congress that's in flight right now, right? They've been ousted from Philadelphia. Um, uh, we also want to uh, kind of hang our hat on, um, you know, some of the storytelling around, you know, you're in this camp and every smallpox is endemic, right? Um, uh, nobody has any boots, everybody's starving. Uh, it's cold and freezing. And it gives us a good contrast of uh, we've had adventure stories along the way and ch chapters that we've created that are a li little bit more rah-rah, gung-ho action movie. Uh -huh. yeah. um, and giving us the ability to have a long slog of winter quarters, um, especially when we tie in some sort of espionage elements to it. It 
it allows um, you know to really set the stakes of even despite your previous successes in the storyline, things you know there are still things that are beyond your control, um, and there's still just very real uh, suffering and tension, and, and I think that's always great for uh, any type of storytelling to have. Well, the, the other thing with Valley Forge being so close to Philadelphia and things being so uh, unstructured during the period uh, probably helps your storytelling as well. Um, do you want to talk a little bit in general about um, how you've adapted 5e? Because one of the things I think our viewers would be interested in is understanding how uh, Nations and Canons is the same and different. And I know that you have sort of two flavors. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about that as well. Sure. Yeah. So um, our main reason for working with an you know, established uh, rule set like D and D um, is is a, uh, adoption, but particularly adoption for the sake of uh, use in educational environments. Right. Um, I've been uh, talking to a lot of teachers uh, who are interested in using this, not per se as an in classroom exercise, but for extracurriculars. Right. D and D clubs, um, intensives like uh, special needs classrooms, etc. Um, and uh, any time that you're working with educators who are, you know, uh, God bless them, right, overloaded uh, with a million things going on, um, asking them to learn a completely bespoke rule set um, on top of everything else uh, is a non-starter. Um, and so the kind of strategic decision making that we had was that, um, well, uh, any game curious educator um, or librarian or, you know, docent at a historic site, what have you, right, is probably already a little bit familiar with D and D, right? Um, and so, if we, or they have people in their professional network or interested students who know the rules. So there is that core kernel of adoption. Um, and then, if we can latch onto that and then build something that allows you to use it and to actually, uh, you know, tell stories in a historical setting, um, then you know your you your D and D club suddenly has educational value. Um, it's it's not just purely an extracurricular. It's one that's actually engaging with key topics in civics and social studies. Um, and so the way we did that is by you know looking at sort of the 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 action economy and the power and class fantasies um, of Dungeons and Dragons, um, trying to find ways where you know uh, we've built a whole. A uh, complicated black powder system. Um, we think it's probably the most sophisticated and well-rounded black powder system that anybody's ever built for the, the game. Because specifically, we knew that by pulling out magic and supernatural elements, you would lose a lot of complexity and character expression and decision making. Um, and so we we have uh, a pretty sophisticated you know equipment system. Um, you can go into battle and you pick your war gear, you know, where uh, you might have a brace of pistols slung across your best, your, your chest like Blackbeard, uh, or a gorget that increases your armor class, right? So different ways that you can kind of uh, lean into the, the Continental Ranger gun-toting uh, fantasy a little bit. Um, it also leads to different type of play styles. Okay. So the other thing with 5e is it gives you a fair amount of structure in terms of advancement and other things, unlike Fate and some of the other systems. Yeah, so welcome, Harold. Hi. Um, we're getting together today to talk about the American Revolution and the challenges and fun in uh, game design uh, related to the American Revolution. And along the way, we'll probably talk about interesting things we've learned that surprised us as we got into the history more and more. Um, Harold, why don't you give people a quick introduction? I mean, you're an award-winning game designer and, and did the coin game on the American Revolution from GMT. So please fill us in a little bit more. Oh, we're not getting sound from you, Harold. We'll give him a second. Oh, we saw him mute and unmute, but we're still not getting any song. So I'll let him and Brant troubleshoot that. It, wow. it may be the inevitable double mute of both the uh, the microphone and StreamYard being muted somehow. Okay. So I'm going to let them work on that a little bit, and we'll move on. Um, so, uh, Pat, as you were designing things, one of the things that I, I noticed you've done recently is you've sort of... Uh, this probably isn't the best word, but you sort of bifurcated the system in that you now have 
the heroic fantasy version of the revolution, which basically uses the tropes and tools of 5e to represent something that's more or less historical. And now you've started doing some things that are more fantasy oriented that for the people who are in the D&D tradition and the fantasy and, and sci-fi traditions. Can you talk about how you've, you've looked at that twofold approach? I, honestly, in a way, it's kind of putting stuff back that was already there. Um, you know, we uh, we started off with kind of an, an unusual value proposition of, all right, now you can use this rule set to play historically oriented games. And there are folks that are super inter interested in that, in that specific niche. Um, but we found that, you know, um, at over a third of the players that use Nations and Canons run it in a kind of a flintlock fantasy, you know, like a Brotherhood of the Wolf um style uh, aesthetic where uh, there is uh, a little bit of of the supernatural or witch hunting like creeping back into the world uh of the games that they 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 run and the, the campaigns and stories that they tell um and so in a way uh we're working with a rule set that already has a lot of that material you know you've got rules for for zombies and and wizards and and you know big spell casting and the like um what it comes down to uh with uh the our, our sort of prototype uh benjamin franklin banshee slayer product line um is finding ways to integrate those uh, abilities into something that feels period appropriate, right? Um, so that you you can kind of have the kitchen sink, um, but it still feels grounded and it feels like it's it's uh, it's working in that world. Um, yeah, there's a lot of free to, to to spread a storyline. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of um, like myth and and legend and you know sort of Sleepy Hollow style folklore um, from uh, the colonial era. Uh, particularly, I found that the uh, like German settlers. Um, uh, in and around, um, you know, uh, Philadelphia and some of the, the Appalachians, uh, or, or all across Pennsylvania, really, um, they had a whole a very well uh, developed uh, folkloric uh, and sort of white magic, um, uh, you know, traditions and beliefs um, that's very different from uh, like traditional beliefs in the Anglophile world, um, but still like recognizably colonial. Uh, you mix in things like um, the influence from uh, the the Caribbean and you know uh, Haitian uh, th those cultures um, and then of course we're the big challenge is we definitely want to incorporate uh, indigenous uh, folklore and storylines but it comes down to uh, identifying what material there is appropriate to to gamify and to actually incorporate um, and what is still you know contemporarily used or, or holds like significant spiritual value that's always a balancing act right um, and so we have some some uh, cultural consultants that we're working with right now to kind of compile uh, a list of things that we think are, are going to be cool and fun and not not going to step on anybody's toes per se okay well it looks like Harold's back and we'll check to see if we got the sound problem fixed hey Harold <laughs> How are you guys doing? Did you hear me? <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. Uh, Fantastic. We can hear you. We're thrilled. <laughs> okay. So uh, I guess we'll go back to sort of the, the, the preamble introduction <laughs> part. Uh, talk to people about the work that you've done on the American Revolution and what different game or games you've, you've done with that. Yeah. Um, again, sorry for the disruption. And I appreciate being invited to talk with you guys. Uh, good fun. on a. Is it Sunday? I've lost track. Uh, All day, yeah. <laughs> So, um, you know, I, I, my first, uh, my first game design was Liberty or Death, which, which was, um, number three, four, five, something like that in the coin series. So the first trip and in, back into history with coin, at least, uh, you know, back to, to, I don't know what 18th century, uh, history and before, and, um, <clears throat> that was, uh, great fun for me and, and it's in its third printing now. So, uh, it's been, uh, it's been well played and, and, and I'm very happy for that. And, 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 uh, just proud of that game. The, uh, after that I did, uh, for strategy and tactics, I did a game called campaigns of 1777, which was, um, really just, uh, you know, kind of Burgoyne's campaign down the Hudson, up the Hudson. Um, and, um, and the, the associated response or lack of response by the Americans. And, um, that was just a, that that game sort of came out of a discussion I'd had with Mark Miklos about um, the Battle of Saratoga and and you know what a what a wonderful victory it was. But my my point to Mark was that it was really fait accompli at that point that the 
British had overextended and made so many mistakes at that point, including not supporting, um, not supporting uh, the, uh, the the movement from the north with an attack from New York up the Hudson. That there was it was over. There was nothing you could do. So um, so that was a kind of an argument for an argument, which I enjoyed making and gets a good bit of debate. Um, I think I think decision has considered reprinting but there's uh it's a there's a big black box around decision games so i don't really know what the hell's going on with it and uh and if they do put it in a in a box and and sell it later you know if i'll even be involved which i'd like to be but you know so it goes um and then of course uh i've done some other stuff but uh but those are the american revolution games and and you know, it's always carried a dear place in my heart. I love the American Revolution. Um, I like to read about it. I like to think about it. Um, I've got a handful of other games that um, are in my brain, but like probably like mo like you two and, and, and most designers, I have tons of ideas and very limited time. And so uh, in that economy, um, an American Revolution game hasn't worked its way to the surface, but I'm hoping that it will over the next year or two. So one, one of the things that I, I think is uh, interesting to think about from all of our perspectives, because, I mean, I'm doing live action role play at conventions for the most part. Uh, mm. Pat's doing live action um, RPGs um, where they're, they're doing 5e. You're doing board games. But there's some, there's some underlying threads with the American Revolution I think are really interesting. One is that we can pretty much know all the major players and a lot about them. It's one of the best documented things that's out there in terms of personalities and decision-making and processes, even though there's a scarcity of information on details like army strength at a particular time or place because it's in 13 colonies archives and overseas. Uh, one of the things I've been discovering is the war in the West and the role of the Spanish because of all the countries involved in the American Revolution, Spain won more victories than anybody else. And they had two expeditions headed to Florida with like 30,000 guys, which is more than the Continental Army. And one was hit by a hurricane and one was hit by a tropical storm. And they were so dispersed that they never made it, you know. But it's also a period where um, there's enough undocumented stuff that there are a lot of personalities we're finding out about now and events we're finding out about now that we didn't have an awareness of because all of the engagements tend to be small in remote places and it's we're getting all our information not from professional historians for the most part but from people's memoirs and personal letters and things like that so from your perspective harold what what challenges did you have in finding the data you wanted for your games and then we'll go to pat a little bit on that next yeah so the um the the challenges I think relate to the data that's available. Um, I think it's highly biased, um, and and you know the victor writes the history, right? So so we have a tremendous amount of American reflection on the American Revolution, and it's very romantic. Um, you know, I often ask people, students, when we're talking about the American Revolution, what would have happened if George Washington was a mere mortal? Right. What if, if he was actually just a human being? Because he's never portrayed as such. And it, it's the, the stories are extraordinary. And and I believe many of them to be true um, and all of them to be true to some extent. But <clears throat> but there's a tremendous uh, amount of bias in the data. Um, we as gamers have our own, um, certainly as board gamers, have our own romantic biases about <clears throat> the American Revolution. Um, and it starts, you know, when we when we're kids, and 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 before we start playing games, and then once we start playing games, um, we're biased by uh, much of that. So, you know, that's another battle that we have to fight. Um, I love the idea, you know, a couple of the ideas that I entertained in in, um, well, I think perhaps the most important in, in Liberty or Death was that the French and the Brit and the and the Americans did not get along very well at all. And uh, you know, the French was arguably at least the second strongest nation in the world, most powerful militarily, um, maybe the most, discounting for for sea power. Um, 
And to think that they would have <laughs> taken this fledgling uh, republic and listened to what they had to say or even cooperated as equals is really quite extraordinary to even imagine that. So, you know, in, in my mind, um, that was something that really comes out with some practical analysis, but not a lot of the, certainly not of the gamed history and, and, and not much of the, of the written history. Um, so, you know, those are, those really are the practical challenges in, in pulling all of that together. Um, I like the idea of not having to worry about the strategic world, uh, you know, because that's really what you worry about when you do a strategic level American revolution game and, and digging more deeply into those, um, to the people, because the American revolution really is about the people. So how, what a cool idea to be able to role play some of that and, um, and, and to tell the stories of the people. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's what I saw as I went through the history. Okay. Pat, do you have anything? You yeah, want to... I'll, I'll take that and run with it because I think there is something very interesting about the relationship between the French um, and, and all these different nations that all have their own stake in the proceedings, right? Um, when we're, uh, I'm, I'm really fascinated by uh, side stories, right? By, by the things going on out West, by, um, you know, uh, these weird uh, frontier skirmishes, you know, on the border of uh, Georgia and Florida from the American perspective, right? These, these little things that don't get talked about because in a way they're not ultimately that consequential, but they're interesting. They challenge the conventional narrative and they allow players to kind of situate themselves in a very interesting a role-playing context, you know? Um, so we have our, uh, we have our first campaign book that we're, uh, we're bringing to print, um, you know, uh, sometime by the middle of this year. I've got notes sketched out for the second one and, you know, kind of following those principles, one thing that we are, you know, there are entire like large pivotal battles that um, we are not covering. Right. Um, uh, we don't go into Monmouth uh, or Germantown or, or, or Kings Mountain at all, partially because we're positioning our players in different places, um, you know, when those events are, are occurring so we can cover side stories. Uh, some side stories like, um, you know, uh, George Rogers Clark's expedition um, or the Siege of Boonesboro. Just, again, interesting uh, expressions that aren't necessarily what leap to mind when you talk about, you know, the American Revolution. Um, but I think the one uh, that is, is most telling is the Siege of Savannah is is a you know one that we've just started doing some research on right and it's absolutely one of those moments where the French and the Americans do not trust each other more than they can throw them right um, I forget the 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 admiral uh, that's attached there it might be Destang um, is definitely not the one that doesn't uh, that winds up ro rolling up to uh, Yorktown and the Battle of Chesapeake um, you know the French uh, their fleet is there uh, for a certain number of months um, and when the hurricane season rolls around they're out right they don't really care ultimately if uh, they manage to take uh, the city or not. Um, and it's viewed from the Patriot perspective as this, uh, as a betrayal, right? Um, so, you know, you have weird and interesting, um, you know, facets to that storyline. You've got soldiers that are coming along uh, from Haiti that are brought um, to participate in that battle. Um, you've got, uh, you know, some people who are trying to cultivate this fragile alliance and to develop goodwill between the two forces. And you've got, you know, others who are just, uh, I just want to try and accomplish our goals. I want to be clear about what's going on. And, um, and ultimately, it's not going to shake out. Um, you, you couple that with giving the players some, you know, personal objectives and stake in the battle. And then you've created like an interesting like web or network of tensions between, you know, uh, different forces um, where you can get into uh, exploring those stories and how those stories feel at a personal level. So um, one quick thing, I'll, I'll have Grant pop up the, the point thing about nations and cannons so everybody can see to buy you know, Pat's product. Uh, it's on sale right now on the drive through yeah. um, I thought what I'd, I'd have us do next is sort of talk about the kinds of things that we see on the Western frontier that gave us challenges. And I want to have Harold talk about this first because he had a, he had a structure with his coin game that made it a three-player game. So, you know, as I've looked into the history of the revolution, one of the challenges is the relationship of the colonists with the indigenous peoples. 
And there's a lot more contact there than most people are aware of, like the Indian world of George Washington, which is a, a book that came out a couple of years ago, talks about how much George Washington really interacted with the Indian cultures. And um, we've got issues with uh, things on the frontier, like the, the battles in Kentucky and the Transylvania Company applying for statehood out of territories owned by Virginia and other states. Um, and what I saw that, that sort of kept us from doing the next increment, because our particular game right now is designed to do basically up to 76. It's up to the declaration. And we talked about whether we wanted to do from the point of the declaration to intervention, which is a really messy time, and decided that the problem that we had was that there were it was going to be a period of really bad news and a horrible time for players to play. And one of the other issues where you had all these Indian conflicts on the frontier where the colonists were very afraid of large numbers of Indians coming into the field, but the Indian armies would field for very short periods of time because they had no logistical train. They had to basically fend for themselves off the land. And even though they had estimates like the Creeks could have 14,000 warriors, they could have 14,000 warriors very long or all in one place. So in particular, what, what I thought was interesting, because you use the coin format, Harold, you had to come up with a way to either handicap or empower the Indians in a way. Uh, and I'm curious how you viewed that, where you felt that you made compromises to go from game to history um, or from history to game. Uh, can you chat about that a little? Yeah, so... so um... <clears throat> The uh, you know liberty or death is 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 four players including the French and the and the native uh, peoples and and the and and you know it's 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 um it's kind of an odd you know chicken and egg question as to where I started um, because I've always argued e even before I decided to design a game that conflicts of this magnitude involve always involve more than two factions. So it's kind of naive to think that it's the Americans against the British because it's just not. It's not even close. And and so who else is involved and how? And I've always argued the French are a faction, right? That that is intensely independent. But the other thing and the place that got me to to have the the um, you know the, the the basically a frontier war built into liberty or death is because that there there was a frontier war. Right. So um, the, the, the uh, proclamation of 1763 by King George was 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 basically the the king right communicating to the Indians that here's our line and we agree not to cross it. Let's 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 be peaceful with each other, with one another. The colonists had didn't want anything to do with that proclamation line. The colony of Virginia, for example, the view was that the, the 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 northern and southern boundaries went all the way to the Mississippi River. So proclamation line, are you kidding me? So the reality is that <clears throat> that there was a um, there was a frontier war going on during the American Revolution, and it was based on the the colonists' desire to move and expand and control land and control wealth and et cetera. So, um, you know, therefore, in my mind, that whole interest that in the game we simplistically and abstractly call Indians was important to build in. Now, um, any game is a model all models are wrong. Some of them are useful. The idea is how can you build in an abstraction of all of these different parties, right? So many different native peoples, Indian tribes, both in the colonies and outside the colonies, some very powerful, some not. Most that moved from the French during the Seven Years' War to the British during the American Revolution just because they thought the British would protect their rights, right? Originally, in the Seven Years' War, they were attracted to the trappers over the people that brought these crazy colonists. So they said, okay, so we'll align with the French. 
when the French lost and they and their choice was between the British and the colonists, they chose the British because of that proclamation line and their, their belief that the British didn't want to uh, to intervene. They kind of separated them from the colonists. So the abstraction was to create an entity called Indians, right, across that frontier that was always vying, pushing, 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 trying to hold the line, right? And if you set on the if you sit on the west side of that map, you can see with the dynamic, right? And you can feel it. And uh, and that was the idea. And so, you know, in a, in a game that's highly abstracted with tiny bits of wood and and little counters, you know, that's how we that's how I abstracted the native interests. Um, and I think it I think it it works effectively. And in 1779 in history, the largest military campaign in the north was the Stevens campaign against the Indians. Yeah. So, you know, don't tell me that it wasn't an important issue in front of mind, right? If Washington approved that movement against the Indians, then it was a it was an important issue. Um and that was the challenge, right? I mean, it, it's so hard because there are so many different factions within that group of Indians, right? The Native peoples had so many different factions, so many different locations, so many different interests that to abstract them is kind of painful. But um, but again, I think very important. Well, another thing I thought was really interesting is I was doing research into the period, and the, the Stevens expedition is a good example of it, is, um, you know, and you talked about this earlier about how we mythalize used myth to make American heroes sound really great, but they were doing some really nasty things. I mean, for example, you know, all of the folks who were in the committees of correspondence were basically local officials who wanted to have a way to fee have feedback for the, the royal court. And as the royal court stopped listening, they became a shadow government. And then that shadow government built committees of public safety. Oh, wait, we didn't call them that. Um, but they drove 75,000 people out of the 13 colonies in 1775. British immigration, immigration with an E, uh, records show that 75,000 people left the 13 colonies for Canada and the Bahamas and other locations in 1775 because these committees of public safety would go by and say, hey, John, you know, these Brits are really bad. You're with us, right? What do you mean you're not with us? And then they grab John. They take him two counties over. This was in South Carolina. They take this guy in South Carolina, two counties over, held a trial, tarred and feathered him, set him on fire, burned off part of his face, burned off fingers and toes, and he became a, a Tory uh, terrorist because they had done that. But they were doing this consistently. And when you go to things like the battles against the Indians, the, the mechanic is really simple historically. Indians raise an army. The first time you can raise an army of 2,000 or more guys that know how not to get ambushed. You march up, you burn out their villages, kill their women and children. They've got no logistic base to fall back on. And after three villages, they fold. Kill their plants, salt their, salt yeah. their field, can, can we talk cut down about the fruit trees. Can we talk about war crimes? The, yeah. the, the, so one of those things I'm curious about is, Pat, how have you dealt with those kinds of issues to keep your game pg-13 uh well we're hmm. that's a very good question um I, I think this is something where having a facilitator that mediates the game is actually really important right um and it gives us a certain amount of leeway um we uh, are not interested in whitewashing right the, the history uh so we want to present it as it is um we've got a little bit of a you know we, we dramatize things and we've got a little bit of a political bias um you know for for the sake of trying to to uh cover some of these things but um you know ultimately uh, if you're a game master and you're telling stories for a group of 12 year olds, right. Versus, you know, uh, some college buddies playing together, uh, you might be very, um, 
less interested in engaging in, in going into some of the particular um you know uh, racial tensions uh, of playing in a bigoted era right um if you want to do a more feel-good campaign um if that's a particularly mature group of 12 year olds right um that wants to grapple with these issues um or you think you know it can be enlightening um the other th good thing about role-playing games is that they're you know we have a storyline but that storyline is it's it's a, a foundation you can take it uh you can run off and tell your own stories you can create counterfactual scenarios where you know uh the country that comes out of this conflict adheres more to the belief that all men are created equal right um and there's a certain amount of catharsis in that um we uh, we position um, General uh, John Sullivan in in our book. We we have a write up for him uh, in in you know there's a chapter where we cover you know a bunch of historical figures that we think are interesting ones that you can hang a hat on and incorporate into your storylines, right? So you know, we've got Thomas Paine um, and uh, 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 you know uh, Molly Pitcher some some more obscure than others um but interesting ones that we think are, are good expressions of some of the the elements at play in uh, the colonies and the, the states at the time uh, but we position uh john sullivan as a villain right he is patriot aligned he is technically he outranks you right if you're attached to the, the continental forces he and you run up to him uh he could be your commanding officer uh but we don't pull punches right you know we we effectively ac accuse him in that write-up um, of atrocities, uh, which I, I think the historical record will bear out. It, it is always a matter of some debate, right? Um, but I think it's it's really important to not lionize uh, the the Continental Army in this time, right? Um, uh, anytime you have any conflict like this, there are war crimes on all sides, um, and those can be interesting storytelling moments. Um, but it really comes down to when you write a manual, and that manual is kind of intended for the eyes of the facilitator you can include lots of content and then let the facilitator act uh, as a filter and design the type of storyline that they want their players to encounter so one of the other things that uh, i found kind of interesting from the military side and although our game doesn't really deal with that so much is the difficulties of command and control and discipline and i know harold has seen that and you probably have seen that pat in that you know when we're dealing with uh, nation states like the French, the Spanish, the, the, the British, they have organized military units that if they're going to do something that's bad or commit an atrocity, it's normally with orders. With the Americans, you've got a variety of, hag, ha, of, of ragtag people uh, across many boundaries, some of which organize locally into local militias, so that the problem that the British had in places like Charleston after they were under occupation, is they couldn't go out into the countryside and collect wood because their detachments would be overwhelmed by locals with rifles who just snipe at them, okay? Um, so controlling the countryside was an issue and discipline was an issue. And the Indians had this discipline issue as well. So the, the point that I want to kind of bring out here, and this is probably more for Harold and, and less so for Pat, is how you look at the command control issues across large geographic areas and trying to get a cohesive strategy or storyline because you know communication took a long time i mean even with the packet ships going up and down the coast at close to the coast distances where the big british warships couldn't get them it takes three months for a message to go north south in the in the colonies um and you know essentially you had all these little detachments that operated independently so how did you bring that cohesively together and figure out where the limits were of what a commander in your game, Harold, could do? So, you know, the uh, on, on the strategic level, it's uh, a little bit about just how do you abstract those things into a way uh, or some effect in the game, or do you choose to, right? I mean, there's a there's a decision you make in the design as to what what sorts of things am I going to model here? You can't model everything, and and so it's it's an important question. Um, <clears throat> in Liberty or Death, I think it's treated a number of ways. One is well, the primary aspect is just the asymmetry between what the Patriots are good at and what the British are good at, for example, and the French, you know, in a different way. And that is that, um, you know, for, for example, the British can can move anywhere, take any space they want, right? They can just do it. 
It's that simple and you can't stop it. You just can't, right? Which I think is the failing of many other American Revolution games is that, and I'm not talking about, you know, any that we've talked about here, but, you know, it's not two armies against each other. It's a Death Star that can go anywhere it wants and do anything it wants. Now, in the context of, of the, you know, kind of a yearly seasonal planning cycle, the British could do that, but they couldn't take it back, right? They couldn't say, oh, we just landed in New York and we put all of our resources there and we're going to take the city and we just changed our mind and now we're headed south with that. They had a hard time getting out of Philadelphia once they took it. So <laughs> That's how right. You figure out how many places the Death Star could be at one time. That's, yes. That was the challenge when you look yeah. at it. That's the challenge. And the challenge, and and again, the Death Star can't move around a lot, right? So so that's all a reflection of this C and C thing, right? That 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 ha- what what can you do? You can do anything, but you can't dynamically adjust it. So that's built into the rules in liberty or death. You can move regulars to the war, but you can't, it's much harder to manipulate them once they're there. Um, and so I, you know, and, and there are limits to how many regulars you can move. So that's just one example. The Patriots on the other side are very powerful at mustering, we call it rallying, um, militia anywhere. And, and, you know, if they're the more angry, they are at the British and there's a measure dynamic measure for that in each colony, the more angry they are at the British, the easier that is to do. And, um, and so, you know, that's, that, that just happens, but, but it doesn't give you a cohesive army. It, it, it just gives you a bunch of, you know, motivated people for a short period of time in these regions. Yeah. And that's again, reflective of your, your view of command and control, right? I mean, you can't, even though we, we sit at these board games in God mode, right? Which is something, I mean, it's, there's no commander that has God mode, right? I mean, even in modern battle that you don't know everything. And in these games, you know everything. So there's a weird, you know, some people often ask, what commander are you playing in a board game? Well, the the answer is nothing because you're not really simulating any commander because you know everything or you know a lot. So, um, include you know, including orders of battle and all sorts of other weird stuff that, that a commander really wouldn't know. So, um, so, so that all is abstracted in this, you know, the, the only way we can abstract it is to create these asymmetries. One faction's good at something that the other faction is good at. And then, you know, that's where the clash takes place. Okay. So we had an obvious question about politically, what's the best term to use for the, the, the natives in America? And I believe it's indigenous peoples. Because Indians sometimes still gets used because it's it's in a lot of the stuff and Native Americans is still this is used, but yeah this is uh, one that we've just started to do some some serious uh uh you know cogitating on now that we have a book that's going to print right and so uh, we just had meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago um, the uh, the Smithsonian uh, has a museum um, and they you know I'm sure had uh, many many very expensive consultants uh, and roots with uh, with the communities and, and, and thought about this for you know years and they changed their name to the Museum of the American Indian um, uh, that I think uh, it's one where I each term has different um, connotations, right? Uh, First Nations is one that's specific to Canada, uh, and and not not all uh, Indigenous groups in Canada, right? Um, uh, but um, we, when we're talking about an academic label for the the, the continent wide group of people, we we say American Indian. Um, uh, we uh, you try to use like Indigenous or Native uh, when sort of referring to like. Just sort of in a generic way, um, and then wherever possible, uh, and this is the luxury that we're afforded as a role-playing game, right? As opposed to something, you know, Harold, you, if you were modeling with a, a broad brush, which you have to, right, for for a large scale, uh, you don't necessarily have the luxury of of actually going in and finding, you know, the actual uh, anonyms that, that these folks would want to be called by if they're written down today. But that's something that that we that we can do in a role-playing setting because we have the ability to get that granular. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think. I'm sorry, Merle. I, oh, I think on. that's a that's a thoughtful summary of the issue. Um, it, it it and and the reality is it's complicated, right? So there there's a little bit about 
re reflection on what was ha what happened in history, but right part of the challenge with for us in history is we're looking at a historical events through the ethics of today's time, and so it's very complicated, uh, and and that's one of the things that we as a nation and a world are dealing with right now is trying to figure out what that means when you're dealing with the atrocities and oddness of and the moralities of a historical period versus today, but. You know, in, in 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 the American Revolution, that term was used. Uh, the, the the term Indian was the term of the day. It may not be what's appropriate for today. There's a book uh, called 1491, which I would recommend to everybody by Charles Mann, um, and and it's it's an excellent book on the history of the Native peoples of America prior to. Um, Columbus, right, which was who, who landed in, of course, 1492. So 1491 is the name of the book. But in that book, Charles says um, with his research that he chooses to call each group by the name they prefer to be called by, which frequently is the term Indian, right? Um, but generically, we probably deserve a broader term. Uh, you know, and 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 Pat, I I'm, I can't imagine the complexities of what you have to go through at this point. But you know, for me, it was Indian uh, in in America in Liberty or Death. I don't know if I did it over again with today's views that I would still use that. But um, you know, I think it's it's a question of specific versus general. And as you said, Pat, if you're specific, you have the luxury of being correct, right? And I, the one thing that I found that's that's a little uh, almost counterintuitive is is most you know indigenous folks that I speak to often prefer the term Indian over Native American, right? Native American to the same extent that uh, you know black is preferred in the vernacular to African American in a lot of contexts today because you know adding a hyphenated American to something uh, does have a sanitizing effect, right? Um, it 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 in a way is can be construed as a political statement of, and then everyone is on the same level playing field when they're just frankly not. Well, the thing I think is this always encouraging is that we are having this debate in America as it is today. You wouldn't have this debate in a number of other countries about ethnic minorities uh, or people that have been abused over the years for one reason or another. Um, so I think that's a good thing. Uh, and I think that our games can help illustrate that. Uh, and the key is trying to be intellectually honest that when you're talking to your players and you're training your players and you're giving instruction to them and written materials, that you try to be sensitive to that and let them understand how things fit together uh, and where you're adding a connotation because it's appropriate for the game or not having a, a connotation because it's appropriate for the game. Because um, games are not reality. Games are tools for us to understand things. Uh, and in, in my world, it's about doing games about the real world and Harold sort of does that too. And now with Nations and Canons, you're trying to reflect that only with a role-playing methodology uh, to accomplish sort of the same thing. Um, so the other thing, I'm still trying to wrap my brain around how, how we build a Monopoly version of Harold's game, only it's got the Star Wars skin with the Death Stars and the Stormtroopers. I mean, American Revolution done as Star Wars would be absolutely hilariously fun to play and absolutely horrible in some way. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm still got that going on in my hind brain because he's got my, my creative juices going and it's good really scary. And then I'm thinking about applying it to role playing and it's the British stormtroopers in red, of course, you know, uh, running around. The Hessians, role the Hessians, Merle. With, with flintlocks and, and the, the fire lasers, you know, it's like, uh, it's, it's just yeah. it's, Well, the elite stormtroopers are the Hessians. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so, um, the other thing is, um, at this point, how have you tried to deal with, uh, minority positions in your game? And what I mean by that is, um, there are lots of groups within the factions, uh, like Hessians, for example, okay, that you either chose to represent directly or not. So, uh, let's start with Harold and we'll move to Pat, you know, um, what did you consider and why did you rule in or out some of the groups or unit designations that you did? So um, I'll give you a few anecdotes. I don't know if I can holistically answer your question. I, I was cognizant of the parties that aren't represented in much of the history in the books. 
Um, so you'll see in the events and the cards, a lot of discussion of women um, that were important to the revolution and played an important role. And I think it's important because women generally played a massive role in support. The American Revolution, both for the British, uh, for the Americans, and for the uh, for the Indians. So, I think uh, I think it's important to talk about it. You know, one of the great ironies of the American Revolution that everybody knows uh, is that you know all men are created equal, of course, unless they're women or uh, black. And so, you know, the the impact of slavery and the fact that we went through this cleansing process to give us liberty and self determination, but we missed the whole idea of these these uh, uh, slaves that were so important. Uh, and and I actually, you know, on a side note, I find the discussions of slavery. Um, if you read um, uh, George Washington, A Life, the the biography, which is exceptional, talks a lot about his relationships as a slave owner. Um, and uh, you know it's it's a it's a it's a clumsy discussion of one of our great heroes and 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 you know a, a topic that had to be front of mind then certainly you know we know it is now. So um, you know that was a hard one to build into the game. It's not really built in. There are a couple of cards that relate to uh, the impact of slavery. Um, you know, w- women were given the right to vote in New Jersey for a very short period of time. Uh, during the early um, early conflict, which is uh, which is interesting, but then of course that was rescinded and and uh, suffrage was an issue for a long time. Um, so that's one of the things I do. the The other thing that that uh, a, a friend of mine pointed out was that that in in liberty or death, at least the native peoples have a, a vote, right? <laughs> at least they have a voice and can fight and can make determinations in their own. Uh, which is another, I think, uh, bit of progress. Um, but um, you know, the, the 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 blessing and the curse of a game that's so highly abstracted as liberty or death is that you know many of these complex issues are buried. Yeah. Well, you know that that's a, a really good point. Is you know the underlying issues um, are issues we don't directly deal with, I think, in any one of the, the three environments we're in. I mean, what we struggled with with our American Revolution live action game was, as you look at the founders and you look at all the people who were representatives, because the Continental Congress was pretty small. At its max, there were 53 people that went to the Continental Congress. And there were about three that were not members of the Congress who hung out outside of the place and lobbied people and harassed them, including Samuel Adams, by the way, who had regular tavern meetings every night, you know, with his supporters. And the, the governor of Pennsylvania, who was running his supporters, which were opposed to the, the Adams group. Um, but, you know, you, you look at this and you say, why is it that they didn't discuss slavery? And it's very simple. Slaves were a source of income, and the majority of the people who were representatives and the movers and shakers in communities either inherited slaves, bought slaves, traded in slaves, because that was how they built their wealth. And if they suddenly freed all of these people, they'd be poor. And all the people they freed didn't have the education or a place to live or any of the other things. So in some way, and I don't mean to make this whitewashed, okay, and that's not intended to be a pun, um, you know, if they freed all these people, there was no social safety net. And that's not good. It's just the the, the facts of, of life in the period. So we sort of dodge that issue and say it wasn't on the table and we could talk about it separately and we could talk about it in our after actions, but we're not including it directly in the game, but we have it in every player's write-up what their position on slavery is. Now, um, you've done that by doing stuff with cards. That's another thing that you'll see. There's a a game under development now that I think Jim Dietz is going to print called uh, A Splendid Failure about Reconstruction. And the students that built that, because we're a bunch of Georgetown students, were very careful to see that all the things that we would normally consider problems, atrocities, boat um, suppression, hangings, and all that stuff, were cards that were events, not actions that players generated. Because you don't want your players in a World War II game gassing juice. You don't want you know mass hangings in the South generated by a player. Because that's not the message and the tone we want in our games. So Pat, what kinds of things did you look at that you felt 
you had to deal with separately and sort of push off the table? Yeah, I, I got a couple of different responses for this one because it's a good question. It's one we run up against all the time, right? I think the first one is, um, you know, like it or not, there is this popular misconception of the American Revolution as this stuffy old white man's war, right? And while that is the group that was overly represented, in the Continental Congress. And, you know, really you could make a strong argument that, you know, the uh, the planters um, and, and the gentry were the ones that came out of the war holding all the cards, right? Um, that there's there's all these stories of, you know, Shays Rebellion and pensioners who, who fought, put their lives in the line and got very little, if not, you know, uh, crippled and uh, then uh, offered to be paid in, in worthless Continentals uh, for the result of their service. Um, but uh, the reality of the situation is, you know, um, uh, I think by some estimates, over 10,000 uh, black soldiers fought in the Continental Army uh, in in various instances. Um, you know, uh, I've read a statistic that like fully a third of that army um, did not speak English as its native language, right? Between, oh, yeah. Um, you know, uh, Germans, Pennsylvania uh, Irish, Dutch, so to speak, yeah. Pennsylvania Dutch, 100%. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, getting into the, the realities of the conflict, you know, it, there is a much more uh, ethnically diverse makeup, um, particularly uh, among the, the, the Patriot side. And, you know, the thing that we're, since we're authoring adventure modules that are written from a certain perspective, I think the, the most important one, uh, bar none, is to never align the player's interests with those of, you know, oppressive figures, right? Um, so we never have, you go uh, undertake a mission uh, for a slave owner, right? Um, that's of, of critical import. And then, you know, mix that politics in with your personal objectives, uh, because that that's a, a, a slippery slope that leads to players either feeling bad or feeling incentivized, Merle, to, to, to try and traffic in things that we really don't want to model. Um, but the second one is, you know, we, uh, we've created a, a system replace fantastical races in in Dungeons and Dragons with roles, which is your position in the party, right? You're a pioneer or an officer or a scout or, you know, a veteran. Um, and very intentionally, the we also have a system called heritages, which reflects your 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 background, you know, um, where, where you grew up, who you self-identify with your people. And we don't assign any mechanical statistics to your heritage. You can mix and match your heritage and your role freely um, because you can be whoever you want to be. Um, and we've identified a number of uh, key characters from history. And you know, we, we did a research there to try and make it so that we cast a pretty broad net. We have the benefit of, of having a somewhat dramatized storyline where you know, you're doing espionage actions and stuff. You're going behind enemy lines. It, it is a little bit larger than life, but that allows us to work in you know, um, women who are uh, undercover, um, you know, serving serving uh, in an assumed identity uh, as a man in the Continental Army, or acting as um, uh, as saboteurs or uh, passing information, right? Which absolutely happened, you know, all over the place. Um, and then uh, we've got, you know, figures like the the, the big one that, that I'll toss out is Seymour Burr, right? Um, so Seymour. Uh, was enslaved by the Burr family, of which Aaron Burr is the, you know, the sort of infamous example. Um, and he threatened to uh, run away and offer his services to the British, because the British did have, you know, several regiments and attempts to, you know, pass proclamations to, uh, to free and emancipate um, people who would, uh, you know, who were at, at slave plantations, um, to bring them to their service to deprive the Continentals of you know, of, of a labor pool, um, but also uh, to just cause general uh, a ruckus and, and divert the resources um, of the, the Patriot cause. Um, and so Seymour offered to, to do this unless he was given the opportunity to fight for his own emancipation. Um, and we're gonna we're we're modeling that. Um, we're modeling uh, a moment where at Valley Forge, where Aaron Burr was, right? You, as if you're playing as Seymour in that moment, you know we've got a little cutaway uh, talking about like what your relationship will be. How do you challenge this? How do you um, how do you create uh, road bumps of you know things that reflect uh, playing in a bigoted era um, that allow players you know to have some challenges in their way, but challenges that really aren't intended to be um, roadblock, you know, big uh, showstoppers, um, but things that you can overcome um, and feel triumphant by overcoming is is the intent. Okay, so 
one of the other things that we've struggled with, and I suspect the, the two of you have as well, is um, you have the constraints of time with your games, okay? Uh, RPG sessions run generally in the evening or an afternoon for two, three, four hours, maybe six if you're really going. Our games tend to run four hours because of the format of conventions. Uh, Harold's game is designed that it could potentially run a little longer than that, but the play is pretty fast. Um, so one of the things we've struggled with is what to include, because you always have stuff you push off the table or what you would enhance with later. So like in our situation, if we ran a six hour game with the same stuff, there's things that we would add that are interesting stories and components of the decision-making process. Like for example, the burning of New York and Norfolk harbors took place. Um, you know, Indian expeditions, the petitions from uh, the village in Canada to the Continental Congress who won't join the revolution that they said, come back later, we're busy. Um, the Transylvania uh, proposal for another state. Those kinds of things we would want to include in a political and economic game like ours but what I'm curious about, I know, Pat, you're doing new development. And Harold, uh, if you had it to do over, Harold, what events would you add to your card deck that you didn't put in the first time? Hmm. <clears throat> I mean like this. I ask hard questions. <laughs> yeah, this is a tough one. This is a tough You know, um the, the well, this is a this is a a, a weak answer, um, but it's the one that comes to mind immediately, and that is um, <clears throat> um, Mark Miklos and I talked a lot about the events in the game. Uh, I think he's a scholar on the American Revolution and the associated battles, and he has a battle series that GMT publishes. And, He's a great guy, um, and that you know, if if we, if we get the chance, I'd like to talk about you know the convention we had where we did the Battle of uh, of Newport, um, Battle of Rhode Island. But he um, he said that there's not enough Hessian fear in the game for the for the for the British that um, <clears throat> that the colonists turned the Hessians into monsters, right? These, and, and the stories support, support that view, right? Again, the stories are biased and they're, some are true. And, uh, but, but the idea that the Hessians were paid mercenaries that just came to kill colonists and were beyond brutal and severe. And, um, and I, I think that his observation is a good observation and it, it's reflective of, of the, um, of the, of the view at the time of the colonist view at the time and their fears. And so I think it's, it's fair. And, and I think I'd like a little more Hessian uh, and Hessian fear in the game as a tool for the British and as a detriment for the colonists. So, you know, I think that's, that's one answer. Um, the other thing is that while there is a mechanism to blockade, it's highly abstracted um, I stole a great idea from Mark Herman, who said he stole an idea from Jim Dunnigan. So um, I'm in, you know, I'm happy to steal from those bright brains. But um, you know, I, I wish there was more battle, more sea battle, because there were a handful of sea battles that were highly deterministic in the uh, in the war. So um, so that's my. Yeah, my, my quick reflection on what I'd like so, to so add. Let me riff off your Hessian thing, because, you know, along the way, there's interesting things you learn. Um, you know, the propaganda of the, the colonists was very much that the Hessians were here to kill everybody. But what's interesting is when they got Hessian captives, you know, almost all the Hessian captives were sent out in ones and twos to Pennsylvania farms where they spoke the German. And... After the war, a third or so of the Hessians that served in America stayed, and many of them married Americans. So it's interesting the the bifurcation of the propaganda from the reality because they didn't have prisoner war camps. The the British had the the prison hulks in the harbors, but the Americans didn't have anything like that. Um, so so now I'm going to. I just thought that was an interesting point to be sure we bring out. I'm going to pass to Pat. What cool things for the period you guys are working on now are features you think you want to be adding? There, God, there's um, 
just talk about things that have to be left on the cutting board, right? Like uh, the whole story of Burgoyne's force after it surrenders at Saratoga. I think it comes to be called the Convention Army, right? And and again, there's there's no apparatus to house these people, right? Um, there's there's a formal handshake of, at some point, we'll release some of these soldiers, uh, to, you know, back to you as a prisoner exchange. But you have to sell them back to Britain, and you have to pinky pinky promise that they won't be used in active operations in the continent, right? It's it's a wild story, um, and for us the thing that we constantly struggle with is we're giving you a perspective at the squad base level. Um, so we want to have a glossy overview of the big movers and shakers and the big events that are going on uh, over the course of, of time as time is passing. So the GM can kind of, you know, uh, just flavor that in, you know, in and around the objectives that the players are, are personally uh, uh, committed to. Um, but we're, we're really interested in, in, you know, exploring that boots on the ground perspective. Uh, and so we lose some of those big picture things because uh, we just don't have the page space to go into it. Um, we do, we do have one chapter that we're working on right now, which is intended to be just an overview of the war writ large, right? The relationships between, you know, like the stuff like the committees of correspondence, Merle, that you were talking about the, at the start of the talk, um, you know, how prison of wars were, were treated, really a deep dive into, um, you know, the the relationships between patriot sympathizers and loyalist sympathizers and how that would really start to break bad, you know, as tensions uh, arose and as uh, as they got exacerbated, uh, particularly, you know, in the South, where it really becomes this this uh, this civil war of neighbor against neighbor. Um, we, I think, you know, we chose early on. Um, we could have tried to cram all this together into one definitive book, which was the story of the American Revolution. Um, but I think we, we wisely made the decision to split it up into, uh, you know, what we're calling the War in the North um, of uh, Bunker Hill to Valley Forge, and then uh, the second book, which is going to be the Southern Strategy, um, which uh, picks up with, uh, you know, events unfolding in the South um, through to Yorktown. Um, and the things that I'm really excited about in that book are, again, some of the side stories that we can cover in the West. Um, uh, and particularly, we're going to kick that storyline off um, uh, in New Orleans at the time. In New Orleans, before uh, the Spanish have actually joined the war. Um, so you could get up to all kinds of skullduggery, because um, New Orleans was, it definitely uh, leaned patriot. Um, it was used as a harbor for a number of uh, privateers. Um, you know, sort of, uh, de Galvez would give uh, tacit endorsement, if not, uh, you know, official endorsement of uh, any of their activities. And so we're really going to be presenting it um, as this kind of like Casablanca type um, uh, uh, adventure uh, where you can get up to intrigue and then follow uh, James Willing's uh, expedition up the Mississippi. And that's another one where I think uh, I really like uh, pointing out uh, kind of corrupt patriot officials, right? And giving you, the player, uh, the opportunity to challenge them, even though they are on side, right? They are, it, these people are your allies. Um, they're fighting for ostensibly the same cause as you, but they're crooked. You know, how do you feel about that? How might, might you try and take the reins or, you know, get them demoted, expose them for uh, for for their treachery? Oh, yeah, the profiteering and, and rapaciousness. It's like, do you realize George Washington was a real estate uh, developer <laughs> and uh, he died with 93 square miles of territory, mostly river land on the Kanawha and Ohio rivers, which he had sent people to evict the German and other settlers that camped on the stuff he had claimed on paper for 20 years. I mean, he was a rapacious yep. uh, a landlord kind of thing and he died land poor. So there's all kinds of things that you find out as you, you get into all this other stuff. So um, the other thing I, I want to give a chance to, to talk about is um, uh, there was this convention at the Naval War College that Harold set up where we got to visit a historic revolutionary battlefield. So I'll let Harold talk about the convention and what we did there. So there's, um, um, I, I'm a, the principal at SD Hiscon, the, the, the uh, it's, we run conventions and have uh, an award for most uh, game that improves accessibility in historical games. And we also have um, Conflicts of Interest, which is a electronic magazine that, uh, that covers topics of interest um, that are related to the culture of 
historical gaming, right? So not just history, but the culture of gaming. And um, <clears throat> because there aren't many places for that, by the way. So uh, in the context of, of that, we have two conventions that are online. Um, so one coming up here shortly in, in, fe in February, and then another one we're going to have in uh, June. And then we have a August convention at the Navy War College uh, that we hold in the museum of the Naval War College. And then we also have one in San Diego that we hold. And uh, the, the Navy War College uh, Museum, this was our first year, uh, and we're going to continue it, but our first year in 23 in August. And uh, we tried to we, we tried to marry the incredible historical location, right, of, of Newport, Rhode Island, but also at the Navy War College, where so much war gaming is done, with um, with the games. And so, what we decided to do was mark me close. I mentioned him earlier. The Battles of the American Revolution has a series of uh, battle games that are most excellent. And uh, I think are are kind of the the battle game on the topic, and he's prolific. And he uh, had recently completed a Battle of Rhode Island game, which uh, which fundamentally, you know, long story short, the the British were there, the French fleet came in, and we kind of had them cornered, and the the Americans and the French army were going to attack them, and then as as always is the case, the French fleet decided it wanted to go somewhere else, and so rather than stay, the French left. And the Patriots had to retreat. And so one part of the game is about that retreat. Another part of the game is about the hypothetical assault on Newport. So we were there in Newport. And we were able to uh, to visit um, but the Butts Hill Fort, which was held by both the British and, uh, and the Patriots, uh, the Turkey Hill Fort, a number of improved positions around the city. Um, and... That was day one. And then day two, Mark Miklos had a teach and play and then a little tournament around his game. But the amazing thing about this was that, you know, we, we had just gone out and touched the history. And then we walk into the Museum of the Navy War College and we start playing the game in the shadows of, for example, you know, there's I, I, I have a picture of Mark Miklos playing and behind him is a carronade from a British warship that they scuttled during the siege of Newport hmm. in, in, def in, in preparation for a defense. And uh, it, it just unbelievable that, you know, to, to, to make that language. So that was a really interesting and unique opportunity in the context of, of what we do. And I think we're going to do much more of that um, where we link the history and and of course, I love the American Revolution. So if we go to the East Coast, right? We, not much of it in San Diego, but on the East Coast, uh, plenty. And, and linking that with the with the conventions. And, is, and that uh, was a wonderful uh, venue. I I joined you all for that, but uh, but you kind of find more a bigger space because <laughs> it was very it was a very right. Ill, uh, select group because of the limited space at the Naval War College Museum. Um, but the cool things about that in particular is you got to do the battleship and ship tour because uh, Massachusetts is nearby. We got to do the Newport thing. You got to do tours of the War College. Um, really a wonderful event. Um, and uh, Harold runs wonderful events. So hint, hint, join more of Harold's events. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. Speaking of events, before we conclude, because we've got some more things we can talk about, I want to be sure to give Pat the chance to plug, gee, let's see, there's Historicon and Gen Con and places he's looking for GMs and, and people to come play his games. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, we actually just put out a call. Uh, we're looking for uh, more GMs for Gen Con, which is held uh, in Indianapolis. I think it's the f uh, first through the third or the fourth of uh, August this year. Um, we want to run something like 30 games. Uh, so we're increasing the number from last year. And uh, we're always always uh, scrounging around to try and find folks. So if you're interested in Nations and Cannons at all, you know, feel free to hit us up. We've, we've got swag on offer. Um, we've got uh, got a, a good, uh, you know, the, uh, burgeoning little rewards program. Um, uh, we also have our Discord, which is where we kind of coordinate all this stuff. So uh, I'll, uh, um, you know, if you just go on our website, you can uh, can access that. And, and we also posted it in the uh, uh, ACDC uh, uh, Discord as well. Um, 
Yeah, uh, I'm hoping to make it out to Historicon, uh, one one of the the Historicon events this year. Um, I got to figure out which one because we're still trying to get everything out to print. Um, we will be at uh, I think there's something in I think Rhode Island Pirate Pirate Con that's coming up uh, in early February, um, and then uh, later this month uh, in Maryland uh, Magfest, we're gonna have a, a little booth. Not uh, I think it's at the um, like exhibition alley or something like that. Um, but yeah, check us out for in all those places. So, so Brant, hit the button on Conflicts of Interest magazine so everybody can see it. Okay, thank, thank you because I asked you to add that. Um, okay, so Pat, um, you know this is sort of the merchandising corner for a second. Um, you know, is there any? What's the next product you all are going to produce? Because you were talking about the Southern campaigns. Yeah, uh, so we got a couple irons in the fire right now, right? Um, uh, the uh we've got uh in addition to the the book uh the american crisis war in the north we're writing right now we also have uh ben franklin's uh poor Richard's almanac which is going to be a, a companion piece for weather and uh, travel rules and uh, exploration stuff it's super fun as many uh you know witticisms as we can cram into the margins um Next up, we've, we're going to be exploring the supernatural uh, a little bit. Um, uh, possibly that may be our next uh, crowdfunding project around the spooky season and Halloween. Um, we also are actively working on our second campaign book. Um, and the thing that we get asked for all the time uh, is naval combat rules, right? Uh, which is very you know relevant to this discussion. Um, and that's something where we intentionally didn't uh, put that in our, our first publication because we uh, it, it's something that would be you know very radically different from the on foot section uh, of the core mechanics and we want to do it right we want to make sure that we have uh, the opportunity to really play test that um, so you know if you are interested in that please join the chorus uh, help me uh, to, you know we've got some some uh, third party partners uh, that we're interested in working with and more folks that express their enthusiasm for that uh, I think the more persuasive an argument we can make to getting something off the ground sooner rather than later so a quick thought Pat if you're starting to talk about naval stuff, Look at the Lake Champagne campaigns mm -hmm. that happened at various times in the lakes, because then you're talking canoes and small vessels, and it fits your squad model. So food for thought. Um, Harold, do you have anything else you're working on that uh, is going to be a product other than the conventions? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if you're talking about games, I've got some ideas um, that, uh, that I can't share, because uh, sharing them creates expectations. And uh, I never seem to meet those expectations, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to say. But um, you know, tons of ideas, and uh, you know, the the uh, the the two things that are interesting to me the most right now are are well, three things maybe is just activity in New York during the war, uh, which not and I'm talking about New York City, so not a lot of battle once the British took it over, but a lot of interesting interplay. Uh, secondly is Boston and environs pre American revolution, kind of between the seven years war and the American revolution, very interesting time of shifting alliances and, um, and, and debate. And then the third thing that's of interest, but a little bit scary, uh, for me is, um, you know, there's another, uh, notable, uh, AMREV designer that I, I won't say his name, but. We've talked about a game where you kind of step back and you just play the role of the kings. And um, and so you make that level of decision, but then stuff happens without your control, as we mentioned, right across the sea. And um and and so as we as we did that, of course, and a, and a point I've made in, in other places often is the you know, the West Indies was much more important to British and French than the America. Uh and 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 so you know. As Americans, we never learn that, right? The history, our, our history books in elementary school tell us, you know, the fantasy. But the reality was that the West Indies was really all that mattered, and everything else was a sideshow. And um, and so, you know, that linking that with the American theater is a very interesting thing to me, and doing it effectively, right? Not in my game, it's a sidelight. Um, if it's the driving force, then what does that really mean? And the challenge, uh, I'll just lay it out. The challenge for me is that in that context, when you have when you talk about the West Indies and trade and the macro decisions, you have to build in the triangle trade. 
Yeah. Um, which is which is really the 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 piece that makes all of it happen. And um, I, I'm not sure I'm ready to tackle that, to be honest. It's a, it's a heady responsibility. And, you know, the economics of the day and the morals of the day, of course, are challenging to us to discuss and understand, but important. Um, I'm just not sure that I can do it justice in the context of something that's called a game. Well, I think you brought up a really good point that most people aren't aware of. I mean, there were like five theaters in the American Revolution when all the different powers came in, and the British won four of the five. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's like you really have to think about that. Um, you know, yeah, Gibraltar is what one of the longest sieges in in you know m modern military history. It right? held out uh -huh. for like three and a half years yeah, uh, against Gibraltar, the, the, yeah. the, the French and the Spanish trying their damnedest to blast that thing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's just like, you know, one of the things that's just amazing to me is like one of the preconditions for the American Revolution was, you know, what happened in, in the Seven Years' War. And, you know, at the end of the Seven Years' War, the Brits decided to take Canada. What was really worth it was the West Indies. And they decided to do that because they didn't want to have the French as their forever enemy, which is interesting because they still were their forever enemy. But <laughs> it's a different problem. Um so where I sort of want to bring us as we're, we're going towards the close is what are the most interesting things, list like three to start with, um, that were things you learned about the revolution as you started working on your projects um, that you found really intriguing? And I'll start with Harold. So uh, I'm going to start holding it against you and letting Pat go second and think about these questions. Uh, <laughs> Merle, I think uh, I can, inherently I can unfair in. and biased against the board game guy. Well, if you want, um, I'll, I'll flip the coin. But you no, know, <laughs> from now on, now, from now, on, future figured, questions. You know, maybe. we 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 you know we honor seniority in the hobby, honor <laughs> success. Okay, you probably there we go. published more than any of us because I don't publish per se. We just do stuff at conventions. Yeah, more than zero. Yeah. So the. Um, there were some interesting uh, revelations for me. One, one of which was, of course, the the frontier war, um, and and of course, I said Sullivan, and and Pat corrected me very politely by saying, um, or I said Stevens, and Pat corrected me by saying Sullivan. That was the correct general at the time in seventy nine. But the, um, the the things that really surprised me was that. Um, in, in, in board games to date, there are a lot of battles between the Patriots and the British. And when you step back and look at the strategic position and what George Washington had, he had a fragile little bean of an army. And the last thing he wanted to do was go head to head on even terms with that monolith, right, with the Death Star. And uh, it leads to a very different dynamic. And it's funny because, um, you know, a lot of players now when they play Liberty or Death, they play in a way where the Patriots are trying to fight the British, fight, 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 because, you know, that's the nature of war games historically. But the reality was George would have never taken those risks. You know, he just could not lose that army. And um, and I, and that was really a revelation to me. It was a, it wasn't until much later that he fought more often. He fought more than just nuisance actions. Uh, and and then of course with the addition of the French, it changed everything. But um, but you know that was one of the biggest revelations uh, for me. Um, the other revelation was the importance that, you know the British mindset on the Southern Campaign. Um, about how they shifted hard after 77. And uh, I don't, I just didn't realize the magnitude of that shift. And, um, you know, they maintained the base in New York and they were worried about George attacking New York and George certainly wanted to attack New York, but, um, you know, it was, it was very, very interesting. And then the last is, um, you know, with my buddy Volko Runka, I, he and I, took a trip down to uh, Yorktown and visited that. And that enabled me to do a lot of reading and a lot of interesting analysis of that. And, and there were a lot of revelations that come out of the Yorktown.
campaign and siege. And the fact that the British very easily could have retreated and intended to retreat across the river out of there, except that <clears throat> they got hit by storm and, uh, and couldn't mount the boats across, which would have given them an effective retreat, would have saved the army. Really just an amazing bit of chance and happenstance that led to the British or to the American French victory at Yorktown. And, and again, I, you know, romantically we hear all oh, it was a siege and they beat the British down and the British surrendered, but they, they could have very easily popped out of there. And well, you got some of these uh, letters really from, from Cornwallis uh, or writing up to uh, Clinton at that time. And they're really harrowing stuff. Cause he's like, send aid, send help. We need help. Yeah. Uh, and Clinton's just perennially one of these guys that drags his feet, you know, uh, and they, well, he doesn't and, like the guy. And Clinton also very concerned about New York, right? Every response is, I'm afraid Washington's going to attack New York. I'm not sending anybody, right? Well, you know, the other thing that's, that came out of what you just talked about is, and people don't normally think about it, is the impact of, of uh, unusual weather events on the course of the revolution and on historical battles. Because, you know, I've got two examples of Spanish flotillas from Havana with professional troops that were going to make it that didn't. We've talked about the grass. Uh, um, moving his fleet for different reasons because of hurricane season, this example in Yorktown. I mean, it makes me start to think now maybe I need to start building the little list of all the, the weather-related cat catastrophes or potential catastrophes that changed the strategy of the war. And yeah, the, the Merle, sorry to interrupt. The, the, oh. the, um, the, the, I described the retreat from, or the retreat, the withdrawal, the French withdrawal from Newport, all weather-related, right? Um, the um, the uh, retreat from New York, right? When he did it, Washington was able to save the army because there was enough fog to where they could pull out of the forts and and you know and 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 get across the river. So tons of weather related craziness. Yeah, it does make you wonder about the, the concept of providence in battle. But anyway, um, so Pat, what were the three big things that you were yeah. astonished by as you've done this? Well, let me actually, I just want to uh, respond to uh, Harold's uh, first point there about correcting some of the misconceptions of the war. So this is, uh, something else I should probably plug. So I'll drop some in the chat here. Um, but I worked on a project previously, which actually is what got me bit by the history bug in the first place, um, for the American Revolution Institute of the Society of Cincinnati, which is a mouthful. Um, it's a game called Revolutionary Choices, and its intent, you know, from a K-12 perspective um, is to really let uh, unpack the notion of the inevitability of the American Revolution and, and put you in the hot seat, um, making those grueling choices. Uh, so it's something that's definitely from a pedagogical perspective. It's at top of mind for me and I think a lot of educators right now, um, you know, to, to, to change the way, hopefully, um, that we, we uh, talk about the the heroic romanticization of, of Washington, um, you know, probably in eighth grade, more than fourth. But um, that that app is uh, it's totally free to download if anyone wants to check it out. Um, the um the things that uh i was found most surprising somebody in the chat has been uh, consistently bringing up vermont uh and i just want to validate them uh because the republic of vermont and you know the 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 weird uh struggles between the green mountain boys and everything that happened um with uh the uh new hampshire grants right how, how new hampshire and new york were were quarreling and almost came to blows right and these people living there effectively seceded and formed their own country and then ultimately at some point when the war wasn't looking great you know prior to yorktown entered secret negotiations to join with uh you know the canadian territories uh, and switch sides um and then yorktown came along and and ethan allen rescinded that offer real fast uh that's a fascinating story and something that that it's great from a role-playing perspective if you roll up to a vermonter and you're not sure uh where they're gonna go or where their mind's at because they're a bit of an enigma to you um yeah most people don't realize vermont was not one of the 13 colonies <laughs> yeah um uh, the other one, the one that I, 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 my favorite fun fact, I think, is uh, that the westernmost battle of the American War for Independence was in St. Louis. 
<laughs> it didn't oh, yeah. involve a single patriot, I don't think. Um, but uh, it was the Spanish versus a number of uh, of, of native groups there. Uh, Spanish and, and using just, French militia because all the inhabitants were French. Right after the French had, they had resettled them or anything. Yeah, yeah. There's this this great story. Uh, I think someone made a board game out of it. Or like this is this large old stone tower. It's like something out of the Middle Ages that that they're the sharpshooters mounted up on. Uh, really, really interesting little anecdote. Um, and then I guess the third one, and, and and talking about the notion of like unpacking the sugar islands, right? You know, and, and how sugar is, you know, the 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 driver of the economy of the 18th century. Um, we uh, have built into our our campaign structure, and I'm I'm giving a lot of spoilers for the second book here, but um, you know, uh, we definitely wanted to address that and address the West Indies, and um, uh, so the penultimate story that we're going to be uh, talking about is um alan mclean uh getting on a boat without speaking a lick of french himself uh and going out to um find the french admiral and convince him to sail to chesapeake bay um and it, it's deliberately like we wanted to put your boots on the ground in saint Domingue, um you know to express how important it was right the 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 jewel of the pearl of the antilles i think it was called um you know, uh, and and to to really give an opportunity to focus on the French perspective, but also the fact that you know the French colonial empire um, is just like the British is built on the backs of of you know the, this brutal uh, slave system um, and and the the conditions in Haiti at the time were you know abysmal. Um, yeah, uh, maybe not a fun fact to uh, end end that list on, but uh, important important one to cover. So uh, I'm going to ask Brant to add another thing from the... Uh, Hang on just a second, Merle. I'm going to I want to pop in here before we get too far away from it. Okay. I want to go back to Harold's comment a few minutes ago about uh, George Washington and, you know, fighting the British toe-to-toe -to -toe versus just keeping the army in the field and, and, and let's just survive versus let's, you know, try and, and, and win a fight. They were woefully unprepared to, to, to try and fight. And, and it reminded me, I, I remembered seeing this a few years ago when uh, when General Jap died, who was the, the one of the main antagonists of the Vietnam War that, that really wrecked life for the Americans over there. Somebody had posted a part of his obit. Well, they posted his obituary over at uh, Small Wars Journal back when the forum over there was a lot more active. And and there was a brief exchange in there. And I hope this comes through clear enough to read. But if you look at the top, the issue of Jap's near fatal mistake in the anti-French war was the too early challenge of French forces in open battle during the first half of 1951, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if you go through and just do a straight word for word replacement of Jap for Washington and the Viet Minh for the colonials and the anti-French for anti-British, it's pretty damn close. I mean, it really is amazing how close that comes through. There's not a lot of the historical record you got to correct for that bottom paragraph, <laughs> which is almost a straight word for word replacement. No. And no. it's astounding that, it, look, we, we, we all know a little more about American history than your average person on the street. And, and that's probably to the detriment of the country as a whole. But damn, you'd think if we'd figured out Hey, we've seen this movie before, and we were on the other side of it. Um, you know, we we, we might have learned those lessons a little better. But yeah. anyhow, folks can pause the YouTube stream and go back and like actually read this in greater detail from from you know one to one. I, I, I liked your misplaced modifier there too, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but okay. but it is pretty amazing how uh, how well those two translate from one to the other. Yeah. And and with all of that, I will now go back to being backstage, and I'll start oh, pasting stuff our back in the chat. Got it. Okay. So Good the other stuff. thing I Thanks, wanted Brent. to mention after Pat's comment about uh, the Revolutionary War in the West, I went to a conference this last year that was out in St. Louis about the Revolutionary War in the West, and a guy's written a book on it because he's a, uh, a let's see, he has degrees. He's a non-professional historian got together a bunch of scholars, including Spanish-speaking scholars, and they looked at stuff in the archives of the uh, uh, the Library of the Indies in Spain. So uh, I, I hardly recommend, if you're interested in the West, he talks about George Rogers Clark and stuff, and I gave him a link. So I'm hoping that uh, Brant will pop that on screen for people. 
because you know it's not like he's making a lot of money on but he's also built the, the board game that pat mentioned uh he's got his own little publishing company um so anyway um something for you all to be aware of so we've covered a lot of stuff did Either of you, let's start with Pat this time, so Harold doesn't feel picked <laughs> on. Um, Pat, is there anything that you think we should be sharing with uh, our viewers or talk about regarding the revolution that you think is really cool? Oh, um, that, that's that's the worst one to be put in the hot seat for. Um, that's the advantage of me asking those. Questions. I know, I know, I know. Um, something you know my one of my personal fascinations um uh is has to do with lgbtq issues in uh in, historically you know in general but particularly in the 18th century right um and there's been an amazing amount of scholarship recently um about uh particular figures you know uh, von steuben uh the the prussian you know quote unquote baron uh who whipped the the continentals into shape was famously gay famously afforded a cottage i think in upstate new york to retire to with his two quote unquote servants um by the continental army um and you know that's that's uh he he, he has been called you know again probably a bit overblown but the man who saved the continental army uh, but there are other figures too. Um, the one that um, that I've found really interesting from a sort of battlefield archaeology perspective is um, uh, Kazimir Pulaski, um, whose uh, remains, you know, sort of, if you look at portraits of Pulaski, uh, he always uh, uh, has a somewhat slight face, very, very fine facial hair. Um, uh, and, you know, there's some like documentation of, you know, how uh, he would dress or, you know, comport himself uh, or, or, or themselves, right? Uh, because uh, Pulaski's remains were recently uh, disinterred and tested and found to be intersex, um, which, which matches, you know, a lot of signifiers from the historical record. It is fascinating, right? And I think it's, it's a great, Pulaski is one of those, you know, great Polish uh, he, martyrs and heroes that's intertwined with American history, which is a great story in and of itself. Um, but I think, you know, uh, to to have someone who was intersex, you know, arguably, um, uh, be a a battlefield hero who died leading a great cavalry charge for a country that wasn't even, you know, their own country is, I, I think, an incredible story, and I think uh, one that deserves to be told. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that would be really interesting, I haven't seen anybody do a monograph on it, is all of the uh, foreign. Uh, individuals that came and became officers in the Continental Army and the kind of contributions that they made, because there's there's one-offs on individuals, but if you look at the aggregate, I wonder how much of the officer corps actually were foreign-born and uh, native language was not English, for example. It was substantial, yeah, for sure. Because the, the ideology of the revolution appealed to a lot of folks. Pat, is there, or Harold, is there anything else that you think we should be sharing with folks? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I fed uh, Brant in the back channel some uh, uh, some references, a couple of books, and um, and uh, Journal of the American Revolution, which is one of my favorite reads. Um, highly recommend a series of anecdotal, very interesting stories about people done by sometimes frequently semi-professional historians that really dig deep into the research of little tiny slices of this wonderful period uh, in the age of reason. And so I would highly recommend that. It, it's a very professionally um, curated and pre presented piece. And, um, you know, every now and then there's a book that pops up that they try to sell, but it's all free and it's just fantastic. Yeah, they've got a really nice news feed. It's like the Society of Cincinnati. They've got really great information out there. Uh, and if anybody's interested in things, those are two of the main sources that I use. And I know that both Pat and Harold have, have chimed in on that. Yeah, they have, they have a great podcast as well called the yes. JR Dispatches. Um, yeah. And, you know, it, 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 they try and get a pretty wide variety of voices on there to talk about different topics. And it's always it, I always learn something new uh, listening to that stuff. So the, I guess to about, close, because we've just about. Hey, Earl, right before now, we close, do you oh, have any, uh, do you have any? Yeah. <laughs> I, we're not asking you enough questions. Well, that's, I did that on purpose. What part of this did you not <laughs> understand? Because um, when Brant recruited me, I said, well, you know, I want to do something on this subject. We got three people who work on different aspects of it. I mean, the, the biggest thing that, that I'm looking at is uh, our games are all designed about the politics 
and the elements of information and uh, on the ground facts that people are looking at to make decisions. Um, and it's really remarkable to me as we did more and more research, especially because the leadership of the 13 colonies is really a select group. I mean, had the British been able to get into Philadelphia when they had the Second Continental Congress and catch all those guys, there wouldn't have been a revolution because they were all the movers and shakers. Um, when you really look at it, uh, there was one F effort, but it was like a local mob that wasn't very well organized, of like 13 guys that thought they were going to take and do something. And all they wound up doing was getting drunk and having an outside, you know, event. Uh, but the, the, the net is that um, it's amazed to me, amazing to me as we look at this, how small a community America was during the revolution and how few people traveled. I mean, when you go back and you look at the Continental Congress, Second Continental Congress from 1776 through 81, for example, the most they ever had at a meeting for the most part was like 23 people out of 53 representatives. So that they had a trouble making a quorum. And it's because of the difficulties of travel and the limited number of people who were involved in the leadership. So this was very much a atomized process where a lot of local things were going on and there was only a limited amount of, of, of common decision making. The other thing that's really amazes me is when you look at the backstories on these people, because essentially in our game, we do 25 personalities representing the 13 colonies. And we start the first Continental Congress, there's nobody from Georgia because there wasn't any. And the second, there is a rep, okay? And you, you look at the transformation and you give them, you know, when they reach a point where they can't support trying to make nice with the mother country, and you know it's inevitable because the war starts outside of the Continental Congress and outside of the decision-making of these people. Lexington and Concord was because the British Army went and they wanted to get the gunpowder from the local militia and the locals acted out. So people were killing one another already when they meet for the Second Continental Congress, okay? Um, but when you look at it, um, you know, we set it up so that you start and you can be a loyalist so those discussions come out in the game because this is an experiential game and then you change positions. So there's always 25 players, but it's like you move. And we run more than one of these at the same time. So people have slightly different experience. But the thing that's really fascinating is how much what people choose, where people stand on an issue depends on where they sit, their background, their starting beliefs, um, their economic class, their, the issues that they have, like do they own slaves or not? Do they think slavery is bad? Do they want to get rid of it as soon as they can manage it? Or do they feel like they have to get rid of it now because they're all tainted and it's sinful? And the other thing that really was a surprise for me with the revolution is how much anti-Catholic uh, sentiment there was, because so much of the Northeast were Protestant and strongly Protestant and felt that um, Catholics basically swore allegiance to a temporal Lord because the papacy owned like half of Italy. So when you say I'm a Catholic and I'm and the leader of, of my religion is the Pope, it's, it's a temporal Lord. It's like I got allegiance to another king. And that was a big issue. And that was a big issue for whether or not they appeal to Quebec. Because even though there was a letter from the Congress to Quebec, and that would be a good side discussion for our games if we expand the time thing, because there's a lot of interesting parts about that. They said a very generic, you have the same concerns we do against the king. You should join us letter. <laughs> At the same time as they're all going, oh my gosh, do we want all these papists in the, in the, in the revolution? Because that, that's not us. Um, you know, so they're... they're the three big revelations for me was, number one, the level of terror used against loyalists. You know, the, the formal and informal. Okay, I'm, I'm pro-British. Well, I'm sorry, but the gate to your pen with the cattle was open last night, and they all ran away. Oh, your daughter got harassed on their way home from school. Oh, your daughter's disappeared for two days. Oh, we come by your house for the gang of guys. You know. That kind of stuff really astonished me because you don't see that in the regular history books. The more I got into it, I saw more and more and more of that. So you've got the, the terror internally and it's the revolutionary version of the Inquisition. You've got um, the, the issue with where people stand depends on where they sit. And the third one that was kind of interesting to me was um, it was really hard to communicate 
if it hadn't been for the person I consider America's first spy master, which was Benjamin Franklin. The committees of correspondence and the fact he was the postmaster, okay, made a huge difference because the way committees of correspondence worked is it was, I write a letter about what our position is in Boston. And he would post that letter, okay, between all these different committees. Everybody would mail to the other committees. So like the guy in Boston mails to New York, he mails to Norfolk, he mails to Charleston, and then all the people print it in the local paper. Oh, and by the way, papers have a lower mail rate than regular mail. Because <laughs> who's a publisher of a newspaper? Benjamin Franklin, okay? So the instigation for the revolution, the communication during the revolution, the rapid post by packet ship uh, that could was rarely intercepted by the British Navy because they were light ships that went along the coast where the big warships couldn't go, um, and the couriers, that was all a lot easier. And then there's sort of a fourth one, which is how hard it was to move stuff over land. There were only three big trails going north-south, and trails is probably the, the best description. And in the period, most goods moved by Conestoga wagon. We like to think of that with the, the, the manifest destiny and moving to the west, but Conestoga wagons were used going way back. In fact, Washington had Conestoga wagons with his Burgoyne's expedition as he was trying to retreat from the, from the battle uh, in, in the French and Indian Wars. So, you know, moving stuff was hard. And then stuff happened. Like you'd get 5,000 uniforms and, and, and you'd send them from north to south. By the time you get to Carolina, there's no uniforms left. Why? Every unit along the way that needed uniforms didn't have them. So they took the 10 they needed or the 20 they needed or the 400 they needed. And by the time you get to South Carolina, there's no uniforms in the, in the wagon train. So that's the kind of stuff that it's like, it really humanizes the entire process in a way that we normally don't conceptualize because we think of it at this high level and we talk about the, the glorious principles of the revolution and how all men should be created equal except for Indians and women and people of, of, that don't speak English as a first language and uh, you know aren't native born. And, uh, yeah, that, that kind of stuff is, is just really remarkable. And you see trends that carry over to today. I mean, the nativist movement for white Anglo-Saxon Protestants goes all the way back to the revolution. And that's a thread that carries through as a major part of American politics today. So food for thought. So uh, either you two guys have any closing remarks. I mean, I'll start with Pat so Harold doesn't feel picked on again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I'll give my pluggables, right? Um, uh, I mean, before I get a just shilling for my own stuff, but I mean, this is great. It's a really fantastic um, uh, conversation. Really happy to be included. Uh, thank you, uh, you know, Harold. Learned a lot. Thank you, Merle, for organizing and, and setting everything up. And and Brant, uh, you know, the the man behind the curtain. Um, uh, something that. Um, I uh, wanted to quickly harken back to is the the idea of like site specific uh, engagement, right? Um, I mean that that uh, conference you were at Harold uh, in in um, Rhode Island sounds really cool, right? Um, and we just did a, an event at um, Fort Mifflin uh, in in Philadelphia, uh, where they they have a a garrison game night where you can go and play D and D or board games, you know, in the um, uh, the the brig or the dungeon, right, uh, or the casemate, where the you know whatever room they have available. Uh, it's very, very atmospheric. Um, but I think the thing that these types of games do really well, and especially role-playing games or improvisational games that let you create your own stories is engage with local history, you know? Um, and so that's that's a thing that um, I'm, I I'm see happening more and more with historic sites and, you know, really, really uh, awesome to see that starting to come to the fore. Um, we have an educational uh, program uh, with Nations and Canons, where uh, any educator, uh, librarian, you know, homeschool uh, parent, um, docent at a historic site that writes us, uh, if you go on our website, nationsandcanons.com, you can request a uh, free, um, you know, soft cover copy of the core rules book, completely free of charge, uh, and we'll we'll put it in the mail. We'll cover the postage for you. It's uh, it's a tax write off for us, honestly, and uh, we really want to get this out there and get it into people's hands and let you tell your own stories, you know, with events that happen in your own backyard. 
And then beyond that, you know, on our website, uh, we've got uh, the core rules book and a misfire deck, which is a bunch of uh, critical fumbles uh, for small arms, grenades, and artillery, uh, which can have um, explosive consequences. Uh, period cloth maps. Um, uh, and uh, we're working on getting that campaign book, The American Crisis, uh, out to print and hopefully have it in time for Gen Con. Wonderful, wonderful. So I guess the last thing we should do is pitch all these conventions that we go to. So let's see. Pat's got Historicon and Gen Con. My group has got uh, Origins, Gen Con, and Dragon Con. Pat's got SD Historicon in August. That's going to be East, right? So we've got we've got a February convention, February uh, three. So uh, so join us for that soon. <clears throat> all online, and then another online in June. And then in August, we're going to have, uh, we're, we're, we're invited back to the U.S. Navy War College. We didn't do too much damage to the museum, Merle, uh, <laughs> we can and, fix that. And, which is good news. Uh, and as you said, right, it's, it's going to be a precariously small group of people, um, the few, the proud. But uh, those that sign up quick, I think we sold out in dangerous. six days at the time. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, we have a November convention. The other thing in this context, um, and by the way, I was just looking at my drive through RPG account, Pat, and um, Nations and Canons Core Rules added 11821. So I'm, I've, been, I've been in for a long time. I've never <laughs> played it, and I'm looking Appreciate your support. You, well, I'm looking, for you, looking forward to you to GM me in a game. <laughs> Um, although, you know, the, the, sorry to digress yet again, uh, and I know Brant's trying to stop us from, from meandering, but he, but he can't unless he knocks me off the channel. It, it's um, not like we have to clear the room for the next seminar or something. That's, it's that's the great, great this right? is the joy of online. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, the, um, um, there's a, a, a group of guys, the players aid guys uh, that play it frequently and and uh, we've talked about playing a lot so but they're they're prolific in the board gaming area and uh, um, love your products um several people noted nations and cannons is one of the highlights of Buckeye game fest last spring with the which, is, which is great because we have no ability to get boots on the ground uh, out there but I'm so happy that, that they like it and they can uh, they and can do it is commuting distance to you right it's in Columbus it's not that far. <laughs> well, he, he, he's up in New York and, you know, it, for me, commute to Columbus is easy because it's like three <laughs> miles to downtown. Oh, yeah. Hey, yeah, one, one last door. thing. <laughs> Wait, one last thing. At the airport, you know, I can see you. Hey, hang on, Merle. Merle's trying to get in here. What One last thing that's topical is we have the 250th anniversary of a number of things that are important to all of us coming up. And uh, we're going to have, we're, we're going to do a, a convention built around those particular issues at an interesting place. Uh, and we're working on that now. So, uh, so keep your eyes out for an interesting combination of history, uh, touching history and, and also uh, playing games associated with that 250th anniversary. Merle, I figured as long as everybody's plugging conventions, I'd pop in here and, and, and add to the fun because we'll see you at Buckeye game fest in, in the end of April, early May. Um, it, Harold, I don't know that we're going to make it to San Diego in November. I would love to. And there's even a direct flight from Raleigh to San Diego coming. Um, but, oh, wow. but, but yeah, uh, it's on breeze airlines. So you've got to pedal to help keep the plane flying, <laughs> but, but there is one coming. Um, so for, for the Dragoons, we'll be at Buckeye Game Fest. We run the War Game HQ at Origins and are pretty tied in with the uh, with the War College there, which is where we overlap with some of Merle's folks with the NSDM is up in the War College. Um, there is a non-zero chance we will have Dragoons at Circle DC. It, I may not be the one there, but but I think we're going to have some folks there. Um, and then, Harold, th there's a couple of Dragoons folks that have talked about coming to SD HisCon. I just don't think I'm going to be able to be one of them. Um, and then in the fall, in October of this coming year, we're going to have our next Armchair Dragoons Fall Assembly down here, which is our in-person convention. Um, so, so we've got the virtual one in January every year, and we've got the in-person one in October. And then the last thing to plug, it's not a direct war game convention, but I know some of the guys in the chat have attended in the past as well. Merle and I are half of the organizing committee behind Connections Online, which is the professional-focused, professional academic-focused conference for the practitioners so we do have some game sessions there just to help expose those folks to 
kind of the, the state of the art and some of the new cool stuff in the actual hobby game space, but it's, it's heavily focused on the professional practitioner folks in the national security and academic worlds. So and that's, two more that's, plugs. that's uh, go and finish. You got two more plugs. <laughs> Just it, in terms of events where the, the dragoons are involved and where we're going to overlap with a couple of these guys every now and then, I would love to have more Dragoon involvement at Gen Con. It's just not in the cards right now because we 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 mass our big fires on Origins where we're not quite as lost in the sauce as we would be at, at Gen Con. So, all right, Merle. So the last two plugs. Connections USA for people who are hardcore professionals is going to be in Carlisle at the Army Education and Heritage Center 24 through 28 of June. That's the week after Origins for those that are buttons for punishment. And the other thing is if anybody is interested in doing a presentation at Origins War College, which is the week before, starting Wednesday the 19th and going through the 23rd, send me an email or, or tell Grant and he'll pass it because I'm working with the War College and we're trying to expand the subject matter again. So like if Pat had somebody to talk about the revolution, it would be nice. Or if Harold wanted to make a trip because he just likes to come to Origins. Uh, but I, I think that covers all our big topics. Does anybody have anything else they want to be sure we mention? I got one more I'll toss in the ring uh, for, from an educational perspective. Uh, so I was just out at the National Social Studies Convention in Nashville uh, in December. That rotates. Uh, and uh, next year, it turns up it's going to be, I think, end of November in Boston. Uh, so perfect venue um, for heading up uh, to start to get into some of these anniversaries. And we'll definitely be there. And, and in November, where you get to freeze your ass off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll walk that trail, you know, uh, by hook or by crook. All right. Well, I think we've come to a natural end. What do you think, Brant? Uh, you guys tell me. You're all the ones doing all the talking. <laughs> okay. So, so last call for topics, or maybe not. Uh, Pat? I'm good. Harold? Uh, good. And, and appreciative of the opportunity and great talking with you all. Okay, yeah, well, that's just, fantastic. I'm not to see if anybody in the audience asked any last questions, but but I think we're good at this point. And if if folks have other questions, you can throw them in the, the chat for this in the Discord. We'll try and get stuff answered for those of you that, that are attending the convention or, or feel free to carry on the conversation over there. Um, I, I'm sure Merle's happy to hop in there and have plenty of discussion with you guys. Uh, beyond that, if you're if you're watching this live, you know th this recording of the live stream two and a half years later, like I, I can't do anything for you about live responses in the Discord. Throw your comments in the YouTube chat, and we'll try and get an answer to you when we can. I mean, that's the best we can do there. <laughs> well, thanks to everybody for joining us. We hope you had a good time. All right, take care, everyone. <laughs>